Good evening everyone, it's great to see you here this evening. Have you noticed how certain words in the English language actually change their meaning over a period of time? And, and I say this in the context of, well, what about angels? <coughs> You've probably heard a doting grandfather talk about his granddaughter, I happen to have one, and say, oh, she's got the face of an angel. Or perhaps someone else talks about a favourite child or a grandchild who's in the choir at school. Got the voice of an angel. And it's curious when you hear these statements, it usually only refers to one facet of that child. They don't generally get called an angel in every particular. So, what about angels? When we think about angels in the context of the Bible, then it's generally talking about an immortal being, someone who lives forever, who does the purpose of God, who's part of the purpose of God. So we're going to think about immortal angels this evening, angels from the Bible, and we're going to just ask three straightforward questions in that context of angels. Who are the angels? What have they done? Can angels help me today? And what is the future role of angels in the purpose of God? Basically, so far as the Bible is concerned, angels are beings who do the purpose of God, who are part of God's power. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we read, Let us make man in our image. It's God talking with the angels about the purpose going to be done, the creation that was then, that God saw that it was very good. And it's worth mentioning at this stage that, so far as we can tell in scripture, more often than not, angels are indistinguishable from men. When you see pictures of medieval art, and you see pictures there, perhaps of the apostles or something, and you, you see a picture of someone with wings showing that it is an angel, it's the artist's way of depicting an angel and differentiating between an angel in a picture and ordinary men and women. We don't get this picture in the Bible. Angels have the power of God and so they can go anywhere and they can do anything at the behest of God. And because they're indistinguishable from men generally, Paul admonishes us in Hebrews chapter 13 to entertain strangers, people you don't know, because by doing that, some have actually entertained angels unawares so they didn't realise. Uh, and that really is what we've got in this Genesis chapter 18. And I'd like us to start here, Genesis chapter 18, because this passage teaches us so much about angels, about the nature of angels, and about the work of angels, and about the purpose of God with the angels, that it can really form our core passage for this evening, if we take each part of it as it appears now. Beginning in uh, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 18, we read, Now the Lord appeared to Abraham in the plains of Mamre. And we're told first that that's the Lord, the uh, sovereign Lord, the almighty God, appearing to Abraham, because that's the context, in a particular place, in the plains of Mamre, and it's in the heat of the day, and because it's uh, in the east, and because it's in the heat of the day, then Abraham is sat in the door of the tent. He sat there resting in the shade, and this person appears to him. And when he looks up, what does he see in verse 2? It's quite descriptive. He lifted up his eyes, looked, and he saw three men stood by him. And when he saw them... He ran from the tent door and bowed himself to the ground and said, Now, my Lord, if I found favour in thy sight, pass not away from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched. Wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. <coughs> and it's important to notice that at this stage, what Abraham is doing is the ordinary courtesy of the day. It's nothing remarkable. It's nothing fantastic. If I was to knock on your door one afternoon, you'd surely invite me in and offer me a cup of tea. Well, this is the equivalent here in, in the Middle East. 
been made very welcome. Water uh, so that you can be refreshed and wash your feet because they'd walk in open sandals, of course, on, on dusty roads with no tarmac. So it's a courtesy, it's a hospitality. It's how you made people welcome. And verse 5 says, well, I'll fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts. And after that, you will pass on because therefore you come to your servant. And I say, yes, please, that would be very nice. So at this stage, it's just someone stopping on a journey and being refreshed being offered refreshments. And then we notice something which perhaps is slightly curious and may give us an idea that something unusual is about to happen because in verse 6 we read that Abraham hastens into the tent to Sarah, his wife, <coughs> and he says ready, he says uh, to Sarah, make ready three measures of fine meal needed, make cakes on the hearth. And he ran to the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good. And I'm just wondering whether that isn't slightly unusual, because if you came to my house, you'd be very welcome, and I'd offer you a cup of tea, and uh, I'm, I'm sure Amy would provide some refreshments. I certainly wouldn't have the temerity to suggest to her what she should prepare and how she should do it. So maybe here Abraham is perhaps thinking he needs to do something particular for these men. He realises that they are rather important, and so he goes about preparing a feast. Uh, and so verse 8, he took butter and milk and the calf which he addressed and set it before them. So a little bit of time's gone by now. A calf's been killed and it's been dressed and it's been prepared. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. So you can imagine now this is a position of great hospitality. Abraham sort of acting as mine host. He stood under the tree in the shade and his guests are there eating. And then something very remarkable happens, and perhaps we don't notice it on first reading. They're sat there under the tree, having this refreshment, and one of these three men says to Abraham, Where's Sarah, your wife? And immediately there's a couple of things we need to appreciate. How did this man know that Abraham's wife was called Sarah? And when he asks, Where is she? He says, she's in the tent. And again, we need to put ourselves in that scene and really try to imagine what it was like. Because if you came to our house and you said, where's your wife? And I said, well, she's in the kitchen. Uh, it would mean that she was in a room next door and we could really talk about anything we wanted to because she'd be rather busy. But that's not the case here, is it? Sarah's in the tent. She's invisible because she's going about her duties in the tent, but she can hear what's going on. And that's really important as this narrative develops, because what do we find then? Uh, in verse 10, Sarah's in the tent, verse 10, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Wonderful news, uh, marvellous news as it turns out. Um, but notice, almost as a byway, halfway through the verse, and Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And that's why I needed to point out to you that it's different to being in our houses today. Sarah heard what was said. And that gives us a real clue as we go through and see what happens in this narrative. <coughs> Abraham and Sarah were both old. There's no likelihood they were going to have any children. This was, this was an astonishing revelation, if you like. And naturally enough, then in verse 12, Sarah laughed within herself. You can imagine the thought process, can't you? You're in the tent, you can't see what's going on outside. And someone says, oh, your wife's going to have a child, going to have a son. Well, that's going to be uh, wonderful. And it's going to be fairly unlikely, she thinks, and smiles to herself. But it's to herself. See, she hasn't laughed out loud or anything like that. Uh, and then... Verse 13, the Lord, so it appears one of these three men, the Lord says unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And now the conversation is taking a complete turn, has it? It's not a casual chat now. It's not a nice entertaining afternoon now. It's a very serious conversation. Why did Sarah laugh? How did the angel know she'd laughed? She'd only laughed inside herself. Is anything too hard for the Lord? 
It's a challenge. Are you challenging the power of God? Are you challenging that God can't do what he says? Uh, says this, this man to Sarah and Abraham's there as well. He goes on, he notices, he says, is it too hard for the Lord, for the mighty God? Verse 14. Uh, at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah is absolutely petrified. She denies it. She, I didn't laugh at all. How could you suggest such a thing? She's really frightened. She's really upset. Uh, but this clearly turns out to be an angel says, no, you did laugh. And you notice the angel knew. Knew what was in Sarah's mind. And then just look at verse 16. The men arose and bent and looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them a little way to take them on the journey as was the common courtesy of the day. And so verse 17 notice again it's referring to this person called the Lord. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord <clears throat> to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken. And it goes on to say that uh, he's going to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And actually there's then a discussion between these three men who quite clearly now we see must be angels because they represent God. One of them's got the name of the Lord. It's called by the name of the Lord. And Abraham is, because his nephew is there in Sodom, is trying to barter, if you like, try, trying to haggle with these three men. Uh, and he says, um, for example, in verse 24, if there are 50 righteous men in the city, will you destroy the city and not spare it for 50 righteous? And uh, he goes on to say in verse 26, the Lord says, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, I will spare it. And he goes on and he works down to uh, 20. Uh, and he knows that there's not really going to be 20 people there. But you notice what's happened. These three men, referred to as the Lord, have spoken to Abraham, have made him a tremendous promise, which we see the rest of Scripture fulfilling and explaining for us. But one of these men at least could understand what Sarah was thinking, could make a promise to her on behalf of God that would be fulfilled. And then right at the end of this chapter, verse 33, the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished communing with Abraham. Abraham returns to his place and two angels go to Sodom. So it appears that these three men are three angels, one bearing the name of the Lord, <coughs> and certainly that one is able to uh, negotiate on behalf of the Lord and with Abraham for the city of Sodom, if you could find enough righteous people. And the Lord goes his way in verse 33, and then chapter 19, verse 1, two angels come to Sodom at even. You see how that explains to us so much about angels. They bear the messages of God. They work on behalf of God. They carry the instructions of God. They've got the power to negotiate on behalf of God. They've got the power to act and to destroy cities on behalf of God. So that gives us a, quite an insight in that one narrative to what angels do and to their power and their purpose within the purpose of God. So... Let's have that as a background and think a little bit further now, open the subject up and think, well, well, what else do angels do? What is their purpose, so far as the scripture is concerned? And one of the things that you'll be very familiar with, I'm sure, is they deliver messages on behalf of God. Let's go to one that you'll know very well, Luke chapter 1, that we're all familiar with. Uh, it's obviously about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, the work of the angel on this occasion is very clear, very straightforward. Luke chapter 1 and verse uh, 30. It's actually starting in verse 26, of course. In six months, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee called Nazareth. <coughs> and here we know the name of this angel. There's only two or three angels that we know the name of. But here we know the name of this one. 
and verse 30, very wonderful message given by this angel on behalf of God. Verse 30, Luke 1, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall roll over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. What a fantastic thing to say to someone. What an incredible message that this angel called Gabriel gives to Mary, something she couldn't have imagined. And yet here, she's going to have a son who's going to be called Jesus, who's going to rule over the house of Jacob forever. One of the most marvellous messages in the whole of history, delivered by an angel to a lady called Mary. Wonderful, hopeful, exciting message. But some of the messages and some of the responsibilities of the angel are fearsome, fearful and fearsome. Let me give you an example now from Exodus chapter 23 where we're talking about Israel uh, going through the wilderness and there's a very clear message here given to us of the role of an angel in this context. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Exodus uh, chapter 23 and let's just pick it up here in verse 20 where God gives Moses this marvellous message, this incredible message uh, to consider. Exodus chapter 20, uh, 23 and verse 20. Behold, he says, I send an angel before thee to bring thee, to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Well, that's a marvellous uh, positive message as well, isn't it? God saying to Moses, I've got an angel who's going to keep you in the way, who's going to take you in the way that's prepared for you to the place that I want you to go. But this is a very powerful angel. Look at verse 21. Beware of him. This isn't some cuddly picture. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not. He will not pardon your transgressions. Because my name is in him. This is a very special angel. It's an angel that could lead the people, could prepare the way, could keep them in the way, deliver them into the land, but be very wary of him. Don't provoke him. Don't test his patience. Because he will not pardon your iniquities. Because my name is in him. But if thou wilt indeed obey his voice, then I will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. No middle ground. You're either in the care of the angel with his mighty power or you're at the mercy of the angel with his mighty power. 4 verse 23, Mine angel shall go before thee, bring thee in unto the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Israel had to have confidence in God, and if they'd got that confidence in God, God's angel would guide them in the way, would keep them in the way, and would deliver them from their enemies, and they would find peace. The angel of God will protect his people, his collective people of Israel and bring them into the way. But God's angels are also concerned about individuals, very special individuals in this example I'm going to give you, but individuals nevertheless. The Lord Jesus Christ himself on this occasion uh, in Luke chapter 22 where we see that the angel is there to support the Lord. But it's very important to understand exactly how this works. It's, it's very precise in the information that we're given. Luke chapter 22 and verse uh, 39. Again, you will know the context. So I'm not going to go into it in any detail. The Lord 
went out, Luke 22, verse 39, went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, <clears throat> if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him. But I'd like us just to notice exactly what happened there. It's really important. It teaches us a lot about how God cares for us and how God expects us to react to him. The Lord prays that if it were possible, this cup should be removed from him. Such a horror that he was going to go through. But nevertheless, the Lord says to his father, not my will, but thine be done. And when the Lord has resigned himself totally to the will of God, then there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. So we see that angels will care for individuals. In this case, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But they will comfort and support. And they can because they are immortal beings. They're so much stronger, so much more powerful, so much more able than we are. And while you're in Luke 22, just turn back to Luke chapter 20, <coughs> where here we have this, this picture of the angel in verse 35. It's talking about those who will be counted worthy of the resurrection. But it uses the position of angels in the purposes of God uh, to explain it. <coughs> uh, so those who are, are in the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 35, Luke 20, they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, that's the world in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, neither can they die any more, because they are equal unto the angels, and they are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So that tells us that angels don't marry, it tells us that angels don't die. They're immortal, they're in the purpose of God. <coughs> so that's given us a very brief idea of what angels have done in the purpose, in the, in the past rather, what they do in the purpose of God. So, can angels help me today? The answer from the Bible is very clear and very straightforward. Yes, they most certainly can. Look at that example that we've seen of the angel with the message for Mary. That's a message of life. That's a message of hope. That's a message of expectation, of anticipation of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that you and I are invited to. It's a message that was delivered by the angel. But of course we don't see angels, or at least we don't perceive them as such. And in a marvellous way, that's unimportant. And the reason why I say that is because if you come with me to Psalm 34, we see here a picture of angels which gives us all reassurance and confidence, uh, not just for today, but for the future as we see it. And there's a little twist here. Very often in the Bible, when you read a few passages, a few verses together, you get two sides of a coin which help us to understand the purpose of God and the part that we can share in it. And this is a marvellous example, Psalm 34 and verse 7. <coughs> Maybe you know this verse. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. That's a marvellous positive idea, isn't it? The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. So if we trust in the Lord God himself, then as Paul says, all things work together for good to those who are called according to the purposes of God and delivers them. But then he gives us what I suggest to you is a challenge. Let's just put these two verses together and, and see what they're saying to us. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. It's almost as if the psalmist is saying, don't be afraid to put God to the test. Taste and see. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about those who fear him. That's the key. 
And if you do, then your confidence is in God. Taste and see. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Through the work of the angels, we can have confidence in God. We can have faith in God, which will please God and move us toward his glorious kingdom. Or for another example, when we think about the work of the angels, they come to Hebrews chapter 1 with me, right at the other end of the Bible, I know, but here uh, we have this picture uh, which should give us all solace. Uh, and you notice I've deliberately picked uh, a passage from the Old Testament and a passage from the New, because the message is the same. The message is that the angels are there to do God's bidding, and God cares about us. So Hebrews uh, chapter... One. Let's pick it up now, just at verse 13. It's talking about the power of God in the household of David and how the uh, priests in the household of David's line were to bring sacrifices that were acceptable to God. But, verse 13, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The angels weren't like the Lord Jesus. They weren't that elevated. They weren't going to take on the throne of God. But their role, verse 14, is very straightforward. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? The angel's job is to care for those who fear God. That can be you. If you accept the Lord Jesus Christ and you're baptised into his name, then all things work together for good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You see, now as we build up this picture of the angels, we can have confidence because God sends the angels to do his will in the earth. <coughs> in fact, if you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember what he said in Matthew 26. Do you not think that I can now appeal to my Father now and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? I should ask for it. I'm not quite sure what your Roman history is like. I know what my maths is like. But uh, I make that something like 72,000 angels. It's an awful lot of angels which were at the disposition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he was God's only begotten son. And therefore central to the purpose of God. And the work of the angels was there to support him as well. So yes, the angels can help us today. But what's their role in the future? What's the completion of their work uh, under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, uh, if we go to Matthew chapter 24, it shows us that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, then the angels are going to be part of the work that needs to be done when the Lord first returns and begins to move towards the establishment of the kingdom of God upon the earth. <coughs> Matthew 24 and verse 29. It's talking about a time of terror in the land of Israel, which is a subject all of its own. And verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, the trials, the troubles of those days, the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, when they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. The Lord Jesus Christ coming back to the earth and then, verse 31, he shall send his angels with the sound of the trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he's going to send out the angels of God to gather his people together, his elect, those who are part of the purpose of God. So that they can be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And just, just to finally bring that thought to its conclusion, if you come to the second letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, then you'll see there that actually, again, it's this power of God, this mighty power of God demonstrated by the trumpet sound of God um, that's going to demonstrate the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second of Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1. And verse 7. <coughs> the Thessalonians had a real problem at the moment because they believed in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed that the Lord Jesus Christ would come back and establish the kingdom of God. 
and yet some of their number were being persecuted, some were even dying at this time. And so they were very worried, they didn't understand it all. And so Second um, Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The Lord Jesus Christ revealed from heaven with his mighty angel, with the trumpet sound of God, the clarion call to the resurrection. So the angels have always been part of the work of God right from the very beginning. Let us make man in our image, right to the very conclusion when God shall dwell with men and men will acknowledge God as their God. So the angels are there. They are an inherent part of the purpose of God. But I think what they give us is a challenge to see whether we can really accept this word of God. And I leave you with this same challenge as well. As we go away this evening, thinking about the work of the angels and the power and the might of the angels, and the angel that God said, be afraid of him, be aware, beware of him, it doesn't bear my name in vain. Let's just remember the promise that's there as well as we think about the kingdom of God when the Lord returns. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him.